Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to take a look at the Frenet Surrey apparatus. And what we're doing here is really just skimming the surface of differential geometry. If we're taking a look at the path of a particle, for instance, or which is a space curve maybe in three dimensional space, well, one of the things you might be interested in in knowing is, well, which direction we're we pointing. That's our tangent vector or our unit tangent vector. We know how to calculate that already. But if you're traveling in a circular motion, then you're also you're turning at the same time and you might want to talk about a vector kind of giving you a direction in which you're turning and how quickly are you turning that would be something we could call curvature and then even circular motion in space still exists just on a plane what about a helix that kind of circular motion is also sort of twisting at the same time and there's a couple of other things that we might want to try to invent to describe that motion that gives us the Frenet Surrey apparatus so let's take a look there's a few components here in differential geometry, the Frenet Surrey apparatus gives us an orthonormal basis of three unit vectors to describe sort of this motion of a space curve. Orthonormal, just like our unit vectors i, j, and k span all of R3 and they are all orthogonal to each other. We want something kind of like that for our space curve at every given point. We also want to measure the curvature of a space curve. That kind of tells us how tight the corner is that we're turning. And some method of Kind of describing how much of a space curve is non-planar. We could have a space curve exist on a plane, in which case maybe this measure would be zero, but if it's sort of leaving that plane, then maybe we need to measure how quickly it's leaving that plane. Now we're going to assume that our space curve is defined by a vector function in terms of arc length, a nice standardized parameterization that way. S is a great parameterization to use if we can. So let's let C be the space curve defined by R of S, where S is the arc length of that space curve from a given point. Keep in mind that with any generic parameterization R of T, we may or may not be able to calculate this ourselves. If you take a look back at the video on arc length, you can see an example where I take a helix and parameterize that in terms of arc length S. Now you may remember from that video that the arc length function s of t is the definite integral of r prime from some, let's say u equals a to u equals t. And by the fundamental theorem of calculus, ds dt is the magnitude or the norm of r prime. Or in other words, ds dt is the norm of dr dt. And here comes one of the advantages of parameterizing a space curve in terms of arc length s. If we want to use the chain rule, and let's say we just have r parameterized in terms of t, then dr by dt is equal to dr by ds times ds by dt. And so that means that when we have r parameterized in terms of s, then dr by ds is equal to dr by dt divided by ds by dt. And then, knowing that ds by dt is the norm of dr by dt, you can see that this is a unit vector and it's in the direction of the derivative of r and so this is the unit tangent vector. This is a pretty useful property. Just right off the bat, knowing that if we have a space curve defined in terms of arc length, the derivative of r is the unit tangent vector. So this gives us our first unit vector in our orthonormal basis then. We can keep these off to the side here, dr by ds, is the unit tangent vector. All right, that's one of the advantages of having r parameterized in terms of arc length. So I'll be using t hat here, and I'll use hats whenever I'm talking about a vector that is a unit length. All right, next up, let's take a look at curvature. Now, when we, we can visualize curvature, it's, it's a measurement of how tightly we are turning. So if you think about with a, a circle, as we shrink the radius, we should end up with greater curvature. And another way you can think about this, and I really like this definition, is curvature is a measurement of how much a curve fails to be linear. <laughs> okay, so if you had a straight line, you should have a curvature of zero. And if it's turning away from a straight line, it's going to have greater curvature. Well, if it were a straight line, it'd be pointing in the direction of that unit tangent vector. So if we just think about how the unit tangent vector is changing, we know that the magnitude of a unit vector is always one, so that doesn't change. Any change in the unit tangent vector would therefore just be a change of direction. 
So why don't we just take the magnitude of that and call it curvature. So by definition, curvature, kappa, is equal to the magnitude of the rate of change of our unit tangent vector with respect to s. And since t hat is just the derivative of r with respect to s, this can also be interpreted as the second derivative of r with respect to arc length. Now, whereas our unit tangent vector has magnitude and direction, this is just a scalar, not a vector. So kappa is just a real number, and it could be equal to zero if it is a perfectly straight line. All right, so let's add that to the list here for our Frenet Serre apparatus. Now you can probably see how there's this inverse relationship between radius and curvature. And well, if you just wanted to try it out, you could take a look at a common parameterization of a circle. With radius a, the parameterization that probably comes to mind would be a cosine t for x, and a sine t for y, and that would just get you a circle on the xy plane. Unfortunately, that is using t as the parameter, and that's not standardized. That's not actually, t is not representing arc length there. You'd have to reparameterize that using arc length before you could then use these formulas. However, once we get past the definitions of all of these, we can get into the computational formulas that actually use any parameterization, and you should be able to try it out. And you'll see, that for a circle of radius a, kappa, or curvature, is just 1 over a. All right, carrying on with the frenet serre apparatus, we know that we have a curve that might have some curvature, and it's no longer pointing in the same direction all the time. Now we need to start talking about other vectors that give us a little bit of an idea about which direction our curve is taking. The next one on the list is called the unit normal vector. The unit normal vector we will use n with a little hat since it's a unit vector. Now, when we were just talking about curvature, we said, of course, that the magnitude of the unit tangent vector is always equal to 1, no matter which its direction is. So this means it's derivative, and here we're still taking the derivative with respect to our parameter arc length, s. That must be orthogonal to our unit tangent. And you might remember that any time that the magnitude of a vector is constant, its derivative must always be orthogonal to that vector. But we can just quickly prove that as well. By knowing that the magnitude of the unit tangent is equal to one, that means that the dot product of t dot t must equal one. Since the norm is just the square root of the dot product of a vector in itself. Now, if we take the derivative of both sides and apply the product rule and collect terms, we should see that the dot product of dt ds with t equals zero. So that means they're orthogonal. Well, that's great. dt ds is talking about the rate of change of our unit tangent vector. And since it's orthogonal, it's perpendicular. It's, it's telling us which direction we're turning towards. So let's call that the unit normal vector. In order to get this as a unit length, we'll need to divide by its magnitude, and we'll define that as n hat. And if you want to simplify this a little bit, remember that the magnitude of dt ds is simply just curvature. So we could actually simplify this as 1 over kappa dt ds. And let's add that to our list of Frenet ray apparatus in the top right hand corner here. I'll reorder it so we have some of our unit vectors at the top and scalars at the bottom of this list. Okay, well now that we have t and m being orthogonal to each other, we don't have to stretch the imagine too much. We can just get another unit vector that is orthogonal to both of those by using the cross product. Our third vector is simply just that. This is called the unit binormal vector, and we use b hat. b hat is simply the Cartesian or cross product of the unit tangent vector with the normal vector. Now we have three orthonormal vectors. Let's just to try to imagine that. If we have a space curve, C, that's defined by R of S, which of course needs to be parameterized in terms of arc length for the moment, then at every single point on this curve, we can try to imagine its direction that it's traveling in, and that would be in the direction of the unit tangent vector. But it's also curving, and we could talk about its curvature, and its curvature is going to be changing in the direction of the normal vector. So that's perpendicular. 
And then of course we have the binomial vector, which might not make quite as much sense immediately until we start talking about the last item in the Fresnay Surrey apparatus. We do know it is orthogonal to T and N. So B hat is just yet one more orthogonal vector. And this is just the same as our unit vectors i, j, and k that span all of three-dimensional space. You can just imagine that this is a little frame that follows the curve as we're traveling. Tangent always pointing in the direction in which we are going. Normal always pointing in the direction in which we are bending towards. Now B, on the other hand, well, if we were just traveling in a circle, then B would always just be pointing in one direction because the normal vector would be pointing towards the center of the circle and tangent would be, of course, tangent to the circle. So B would just be sort of perpendicular to this circle. And a circle is a planar curve. So you can imagine that B doesn't really do very much if our curve exists on a plane. But what if we have a helix? We're no longer on a plane anymore. And now B is also going to be starting to change. Now, currently what we have here is called the frenet serre frame, consisting of the vectors T and, and B. Now, if we start adding in curvature, there's only one piece missing, and it has the idea about whether or not a curve exists on a plane, or how much it fails to exist on a plane. And that is torsion. Now, you can think about torsion as sort of measuring the twisting of a space curve. Again, it's, it's how much a curve fails to be planar, how much it's leaving the plane that it is currently in. So we want to measure the rate of change of our binormal vector in a way. Let's start off with that concept. Now first off, once again, since the binormal vector is a unit length, its rate of change, dBDS, must be perpendicular to the unit binormal vector. Now we also have the definition over here on the right hand side about how we get the binomial vector and it's a cross product. So if we want to take another look at how we can get the rate of change of the unit binomial vector, we should take a look at the derivative of T cross N. So by definition, dBDS is the derivative of T cross N with respect to S and then we can apply the product rule. Now remember when we're using the product rule with cross products, we have to be pretty careful about the order here. Now let's not forget that by definition, the unit normal vector is simply a scalar multiple of dTDS. So dTDS and the normal vector are parallel. And when we take the cross product of parallel vectors, this would be the zero vector. So we can just cross that off. This means that dBDS is the cross product of the unit tangent vector and the derivative of the unit normal vector. Okay, well, doesn't seem like a big deal, but actually at this point in time, we know that since it is the cross product of the unit tangent vector and something else, that it has to be also orthogonal to the unit tangent vector. And here I'm using perpendicular, assuming that dBDS is not zero. Okay, well, now I know that it is orthogonal to B and T. Well, that's cool because, you know what? I already know of a unit vector that is perpendicular or orthogonal to B and T as well. And that would be the normal vector. So dBDS is actually going to be parallel to the normal vector or just a scalar multiple. And that scalar we call torsion. Now, by a historical convention, we say that dBDS is equal to negative tau N. And here that tau is what we call torsion. That negative sign there does kind of give us a sense of a direction. We can have torsion either be positive or negative, depending on whether we have sort of a right-hand oriented helix or a left-hand oriented helix. Now, if we wanted to solve that equation for tau, we can use projections and dot products. This gives us torsion equal to a negative dot product of the unit normal vector and the derivative of the unit binormal vector. And that completes the frenet serre apparatus. Now, remember here uh, that curvature is just a scalar. That is a measurement of how much a space curve fails to be a straight line. And so if you just have a straight line, curvature is zero. And the more it's curving, then you have a tighter radius circle in a way. 
And then we have another scalar, which is torsion, and that measures how much a space curve fails to be planar. If your space curve was a circle, whether it just be on the x, y plane, or a circle on some other kind of plane, then torsion would be zero. And that would actually tell you that the rate of change of the bi unit binormal vector is also zero. But the moment you start twisting, then you're starting to leave the plane, and then you end up talking about torsion as being leaving that plane. Now that we have all of these definitions in terms of a space curve parametrized with s arc length, how do you actually calculate these in practice for a function r of t? Well, to make this easy to follow, instead of using loads and loads of derivatives and differential operators here, why don't we just say that the first derivative of r of t is v, like velocity, and the second derivative of r of t is a, like acceleration. And when we omit the vector symbol, that just means the magnitude. Then to calculate the unit tangent, we just simply take the vector v, velocity, and we make it a unit length by dividing by the, its magnitude. Turns out it's actually potentially easier to calculate the binormal vector first. So b hat here is velocity cross product with acceleration and then made to be a unit length by dividing by the magnitude. And with those two things, we can find the unit normal. Again, you gotta be careful with the order of cross products here. The unit normal is equal to the unit binormal cross product with the unit tangent. Now for curvature, kappa, that would be the cross product of velocity and acceleration divided by sort of the speed cubed, which is just the magnitude of the first derivative of r. Now torsion, a little bit more of a tricky calculation, b cross a, now that's a vector, you dot product that with the derivative dA by dt, that gets you a scalar, and then you divide that by the norm of v cross a squared. Okay, now with these computational formulas, so long as you can get the first and second derivatives of r of t, and of course there's a, a boatload of cross products and dot products and norm calculations, you should be able to calculate the entire Frenet Surrey apparatus. But let me show you in Maple a little bit more of an interpretation here of what that Frenet frame looks like. Now, I'll start off with a nice basic parameterization here. X equals cosine t, y equals sine t, and z equals 2 minus sine t. Plot this from 0 to 2 pi. I'm here going to calculate the unit tangent, the unit binormal, and the unit normal using those formulas. And I'm going to do a little animation here and see how this works. Okay, so you can see that this is a circle. And, well, it should be pretty obvious, cosine and sine. And we also know that z is simply just 2 minus y, which is a plane. So the curve exists on that plane. And so the red vector is going to be my unit tangent. The green vector is my unit normal, pointing to the inside of the circle. And then we have a unit binormal. And you'll notice that because it exists on a plane, the unit binormal never changes. So this gives us a torsion of 0. And with a little calculation here, you should also be able to see that the curvature is 1 over the radius of this circle as well. All right, well, let's try something that is non-planar now. We'll take this uh, and change this function to a twisted cubic, t, t squared, t cubed. And let's plot this over the interval from negative 1.5 to positive 1.5. Anything bigger than that, and this t cubed is going to get quite big. All right, well, again, it's pretty small, so I might need to actually zoom this in a little bit. There we are. And watch what happens to that Frenet frame. The red vector will always point tangent. The green vector is pointing to where we are bending. But that yellow vector, the binormal, is starting to change as well. You can see that we're, you know, roughly staying in a plane for a little while, but that plane really twists right there when t equals zero. Gives you a bit of an idea. All right, well, how about a helix now? Let's just change r to be a helix. All right, I've got the helix cosine t, sine t, t. And I'm going to plot this from zero to four pi. I hope for the best. All right, there's a helix. Well, again, I might try to zoom this in a little bit. It's not going to be, it's going to be pretty small here, unfortunately. But there's my little Frenet frame. And you can see as I animate that, 
There it is twisting around. And why don't we take a look at that from top view? You can see that normal vector is pointing to the inside of the circle. The red vector is tangent as we go around. And, well, even the binomial vector you can see is also spinning around as we're twisting around as well. Okay, last but not least, let's see if we can maybe take a look at a space curve that exists on a cone. Okay, after playing around with this, I settled on a cone t cosine t, t sine t, and t, but scaled back by a factor of 1 over 5, so that hopefully you can kind of see this for an A-frame. You can see, okay, yeah, it's definitely, you can see how that lies on a cone there. It's a spiral going around a cone, and it is twisting quite dramatically at the very beginning here, but it almost looks a little bit plainer. You can see that that uh, yellow binormal vector isn't really changing very much, and it's got a lot of curvature at the very beginning. You can see just how quickly that tangent vector is changing. And then as we start getting up here, and these frames are equally spaced, the tangent vector is changing more slowly, so we end up with a little less curvature near the top here. Well, hopefully that gives you at least a visual aid for the Frenet Surrey apparatus. The uh, calculations are all kind of there before you, so you can always try this, whatever your favorite curve is, and use the first and second derivatives in those nice little formulas. Once again, here they are. You can calculate the unit tangent, the unit binormal, the unit normal vectors, and then calculate curvature and torsion as two scalars. And, and that will help to completely sort of describe a particular curve. All right, well, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.